Shabbat shalom, everyone. Terry, how about? Well, we want to be done by two. Yep. Okay. Okay. You all know that Zionism in its early formation and those who were attracted to Zionism, which is part of a construct of understanding nationalism specific for the Jewish people, which is a phenomena, nationalism itself, that emerges in the West in a European framework. Those who are attracted to the idea of Zionism were a very small percentage of Jews in Europe. It was not the obvious answer to two specific issues. One, the push factor, anti-Semitism, and two, the pull factor of assimilation. And Zionism was a response. There were other responses, right? Like Bundism, like diasporism, autonomism. These ideas in which it said Jews shouldn't necessarily focus on creating a collective Jewish identity in a particular geographical location. And in this case, it winds up being in the land of Israel. But that was not the only offer on the table. And these other responses were considered to be legitimate, were of interest, because it was about trying to understand what made sense for the individual and the particular community in that location. There, of course, were very strong anti-Zionist positions as well. But again, you have to put that in a historical context. It's not understanding anti-Zionism, perhaps, in the way that you hear it today, but understanding it in the sense of an idea that individuals did not believe solved for what was referred to as the Jewish question. The Jewish question is a question that you hear a lot about during the period of the 20th century, during the rise of Nazism. But that phrase, the Jewish question, emerges prior to Nazism. You hear it from individuals who are basically the peers of Wilhelm Marr in 1879, when he's coining that term antisemitumus, who are asking themselves about what do we do with our, our question of the Jews. We know that anti-Zionism continues to exist as a response within the Jewish community today. And we distinguish anti-Zionism from what we would refer to as a-Zionist or non-Zionist. What's an a-Zionist or non-Zionist? If you look at the history of the American Jewish Committee, when the American Jewish Committee is formed here, it's an a-Zionist, non-Zionist entity. The individuals who are coming from Germany, these German Jewish immigrants who are the leaders and the leadership forming the American Jewish Committee, articulate a non-Zionist, a-Zionist platform. Not anti, but not in favor of. That will shift over time. Similarly, we know the reform movement also shifts from a period of a Zionist to not understanding Jews as a people and focusing instead of Jews as a confessional group, a religious group, and then moves again to recognize Jews as a people and engage with Zionism. So it shouldn't surprise us that these terms, these ideas, transform over time and are impacted by a variety of factors that influence the conversation. Within Israel today, there are two very clear anti-Zionist demographics. You have also non-Zionists, and then of course you have Zionists. But the anti-Zionist demographics fall within two communities, sectors of the community, particularly the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredi, and the Arabs. So for example, when you have a member of Knesset like Mansour Abbas, who's a member of Ra'am, the Islamist with a small c conservative political bent, he would tell you very clearly he is not a Zionist, but he also doesn't say he's an anti-Zionist 
And his party, and he in particular, advocate for normalization with Israel, which is not the same as the political party in the Knesset, Balad, or some of the individuals that are associated with Balad who hold, as an Arab political party, an anti-Zionist position. So why I say this is because the discourse around anti-Zionism is one that is complex, is one that allows you to be in the state, to benefit from the state, and also express serious discontent with the state. And I will still put forth that it, that is not the discourse around anti-Zionism that we often are encountering on the global stage. I think it's a different conversation around anti-Zionism. You heard from Laura and from Jeff just this past week. I listened to the recording. They were excellent. They really delved deeply into the nuance of the discourse around anti-Zionism. And I, you know, I'll put it out there, I'm much closer to Jeff on this at the end of the day in terms of where anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism intersect. Part of the conversation and understanding the anti-Zionism discourse is having to, once again, disentangle it from that internal discussion, from the external discussion. In many ways, as I said this morning and briefly last night, anti-Zionism has become a useful guise in order to be able to articulate a position that suggests that Israel has no right to exist. And it's done so in a very politically correct way under the label of anti-Zionism. Now again, I want to be very clear. We are not talking about nuanced discourse around criticism and constructive ideas about Israeli policy. That in and of itself is not anti-Zionist. It can put forth anti-Zionist positions, but it doesn't mean it's inherently anti-Zionist. It does not mean it is at all anti-Semitic. The discourse around anti-Zionism that we encounter most or in the global conversation is a discourse that is focused on what, we were, what I referred to this morning coming from the former Soviet Union, the influence of the Soviet Union, and the way this has been absorbed and played out within the international communal discourse. But I would also ask us to step back a moment to look at some of the intellectual factors that have actually been emerging since the period of the 1960s that don't necessarily at all on its face have anything to do with the Israel conversation and yet deeply influence the Zionism-Israel conversation. And I want to talk a little bit about some of these factors. And you may say, well, why are you focusing on an intellectual factor when I already told you this is part of the political discourse? Because I'm one of these people who believes that ideas matter. I'm also one of these people who also think that what happens in the academy tends to serve as a bellwether for what is actually going to enter mainstream discourse in terms of politics, media, traditional and social, and in the social justice conversations. I'm a firm believer that what happens on campus doesn't stay on campus, and that we have seen historically that to be accurate since this period of the 1960s. And I start with the 1960s because that's the emergence of area studies. Area studies meaning Jewish studies, black African American studies, women and gender studies, all those kinds of very important interdisciplinary studies. But I want to highlight that some of the intellectual factors, which alone are very valuable tools to think about, engage with critical scholarship. But when they become the primary lens through which you refract all issues, then I will say they pose a challenge to the larger discourse around Israel, which is the lightning rod for a much bigger conversation about Western civilization. I'm also going to say much of what I'm saying right now, people don't agree with. It's debated. And it's not an accepted paradigm that I'm putting forth. But since you guys gave me an hour, I'm going to put it forth. 
So let's talk about some of these intellectual factors. One of them has to do with the framework of Orientalism. Many of you may have read Edward Said's book, written in the 1970s. Edward Said, Palestinian, teacher of comparative literature at Columbia University, writes a very important text entitled Orientalism. It's worth reading Orientalism if you haven't read it, and the majority of your grandchildren and children will read it a number of times, especially if they're in the field of humanities, because it has become, in some way, a primary foundational text. The Cliff Notes version, which is not a fair version, but I'm going to put forth, is that ultimately, Said argues that it is unacceptable and inappropriate for Westerners, the West, to criticize the native indigenous population of the East. And if you do so, you are actually appropriating, to some degree, an understanding of the West, uh, the East only through your own Western experience. Now let me give you an example of this that has nothing to do with Israel. When I was a graduate student serving as a graduate um, uh, teaching assistant for a well-known academic who is a leader in feminist frameworks and theology and early Christianity. She put forth a position around female genital mutilation, specifically in the East, Africa, we were talking about. And when some of us challenged the position of female genital mutilation, we were told very clearly that we are imposing our Western understanding on the East, and that female genital mutilation is accepted, we should understand it because of the cultural framework in which it exists. That's an example. It has nothing to do with Israel. Why this then matters is because there's a lauding or a celebration of the native and indigenous at the expense of understanding the West, and what falls from that are things like the idea that everything that happened during the colonialist period is considered to be problematic, and all of it ought to be thrown away. And from that post-colonialist framework, you follow a post-nationalist framework, that anything that the nation state does is ultimately problematic, and you start to hear the ideas of larger, flattening, globalization kind of discussions, but we know that nationalism matters. We know that the world order continues to be based around nationalism. Look at what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. You don't have to look very far. We also know that ultimately that discussion around post-nationalism usually has one case study to say that we should end nationalisms. Tony Jute wrote an important article in the New Republic in the early 2003s, I believe, in which he talks about Israel and alternative. And it's the only case study that he wants to put forth as being the nation state that should stop being, quote unquote, anachronistic, Jewish and democratic. No other nation state is discussed. So those concepts, post-colonialism, post-nationalism, and orientalism become very important tools but again, if they are the primary lens, they pose a challenge. And they pose a challenge for the discourse around Zionism and for Israel. Why? Because in the discourse around Israel and Zionism, Israel is perceived as the white imperialist colonialist outpost in the region amidst the natives. And so the component of understanding the connection to Zion, right, where we face three times a day if we pray, where we recall on our wedding day when we break the glass and think about the destruction of the temples, when we say Birkat Hamazon and refer to this place, right, which is inherently a deep connection to the larger conversation around Jewishness, all of that is forgotten. Let's talk about another intellectual factor, postmodernism. Postmodernism becomes a very important uh, framework that's articulated in the 1980s, specifically around comparative literature. 
Again, as a tool, it can be quite useful for scholarship. But what has happened is that postmodernism and those who advocate using it as a primary lens suggest that all narratives are equal, all facts are debatable, and therefore only giving validity to quote unquote lived experiences is what matters. This then creates a very problematic paradigm and often moral equivalency around the usage of postmodernism. A third intellectual factor is Marxism. And Marxism here is not in the context of economics, but in the context of power. And here the context is you need to weaken the strong and strengthen the weak. And that then becomes a primary framework. And once again, Israel then ought to be weakened, right? And those surrounding Israel and the Palestinians specifically ought to be strengthened. So these frameworks, which if they are tools can be useful, but if they become that primary lens, creates an imposition in which the framework for Israel is one that is, why are you constantly beating up on someone? And Israel then has to engage and respond in answering that question. This language and the field, that the humanities field, which utilizes many of these frameworks, can be done in a way that allows for students to engage with complexity. But if it's not done in a way that allows for that complexity, then it creates a clear litmus test to deem what is on the right side of history and what is be, being created in sin. And very often, it is deemed that Israel, in and of itself, is created in sin because of how it treats the supposed native without taking into consideration the aboriginal indigenous identity of Jews, because it is perceived as a colonialist entity, and because of the idea of Marxism and power. We know that language matters, and the intentionality of language matters. This language is language that has been utilized and to some degree, I would argue, weaponized since the period of the 1960s for clear political purposes. You compound that with individuals who then use their classrooms as a bully pulpit in order to promote a clear political agenda. And that then leaves very little room for meaningful discourse and to engage with that nuance and complexity which ought to be engaged with and deserves deliberation because it is the marketplace of ideas and because if you cannot do it in a university, do not expect it to happen anywhere beyond the university. Now you may say to me, how do we see you know, Orientalism play out today? Well, I'll give you an example. Again, in May of 2021, on social media, it was referred to as the Instifada. On Instagram, all you had to do, for many of us, was open up a variety of accounts, and you would see performative allyship and their political positions around Israel and the Palestinians and Hamas. One particular account used a very incendiary photo and talked about how Israel is a settler colonialist entity that ultimately engages in ethnic genocide. It didn't suggest go here to learn more. It didn't suggest there was a deeper discourse. It stoked emotions for the purpose then of creating a superficiality and a flattening of complexity. Fast forward less than six months, during America's pullout of Afghanistan, the same exact channel on social media issued a post with a very pretty blue background that said something to the effect of, what's happening in Afghanistan is very complicated. It's a decades-long issue. We Westerners ought to take time to learn about this complexity. Look here for more resources. 
That's Orientalism, meaning Israel is perceived as the West, so therefore we should engage with it, criticize it, seek to ultimately diminish. Whereas Afghanistan and what's happening with the Taliban, that's more complicated. That's the East, they're native, they're indigenous, who are we to criticize? Not everyone reads that post the way I read that post and say, ah, look at Edward Said's influence. And it's 100% Edward Said's influence. But young people don't necessarily understand that. Most of grown-ups don't understand that. That's why ideas matter. So when we see the discourse around colonialism, around racism, and around apartheid, very often there's a clear intent with language in order to position individuals in a way in which it becomes very challenging for them to be able to articulate why those ideas, when manipulated for a political purpose, ultimately actually harm the larger nuanced discussion around Zionism. And because it is done in a way in which it is deemed to be politically acceptable, because it doesn't seem to target Judaism as a religion, it doesn't seem to target Jews as individuals, as a people, and rather is focused on a larger nationalist movement, which has put, been put into the same category as white supremacy by many, it therefore is positioned in order to have young people and others believe that it is allowed to be denigrated. This is the challenge around that anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism conversation. And it is not going to stay only within the university. We know that. It does enter these mainstream conversations. And it completely diminishes that nuanced discussion that we were talking about where you have anti-Zionist positions that exist within Israel proper. And trying to understand where anti-Zionism exists within the state and how the state engages with those individuals and collectives irrespective of their anti-Zionist positions. Meaning, the state still finds ways to provide for, we can talk about the complexity around that, the Arab population and the Haredi population, even though they hold those anti-Zionist positions. Those groups still are political parties within the Knesset, even when some of them outwardly, very clearly, talk about how Israel is a, as a state, as a construct, is problematic. But that, I would say very clearly, is not the conversation that most of us are going to encounter around anti-Zionism. And therefore, it leads to a very serious challenge for many individuals when they do encounter it because they do not have the ability to put it in a historical context. They do not understand the influence of these intellectual factors. And so much of it is built purely around an emotional, guttural response. You don't want to be perceived as being on the wrong side of history, and the litmus test for how progressive one is means how anti-Zionist you are. And I'm very careful here with my language. I don't say how pro-Palestinian you are. I'm pro-Palestinian. And so language absolutely matters. So that's part of the challenge around the anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism conversation. I'll just say two more things, and then we can open it up to a, a discussion. If I were teaching a class right now on the Yishuv, like Leora does, right, and writes about all the time, we could have a nuanced discussion around where Israel, when it's being formed, where the Yishuv understood it engaging in acts of colonization, which differs from acts of colonialism. That's not just semantics, right? Colonialism is the idea that you're going to extract resources for the purpose of giving them back to the motherland. The French, the British, what happens in Algeria, what happens in Africa. That is not equivalent in the case of the Yishuv during the period of the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. There is no motherland. They're not sending it to Odessa. They're not sending it to Warsaw. 
And it doesn't mean that it didn't pose challenges in terms of creating what is referred to as a dual economy, meaning the Jews, the Zionists, who benefit from this colonization, which is forming in parallel to an Arab economy that is not necessarily reaping the same benefits of that Jewish economy. We tend to think about, for example, the Moshavim, Moshavot, Kibbutzim, in a very romanticized way when we think about them within our Jewish history. And yet, the reality was they were created for the purpose of Jews. Arabs are not part of those communities. There is inherently then built in to that construct a challenge in terms of then of what it then means to create a Jewish and democratic state. And those challenges are very real. If an anti-Zionist wanted to talk to me about that, I would be happy to. Once again, that is not the discourse. But the language that comes from what I am referring to, that is weaponized for this political purpose. Racism, the second example. We know that Jews are not white. We know that Jews come from a variety of backgrounds, ethnicities, nationalities. We know that Jews also convert to the religion who come from different racial, ethnic, national, linguistic identities. And therefore, we know that you can't just say Jews are white. We also know, as we talked about earlier, that in the European context, Jews were not perceived as white. Jews were the other. If they were white, they would have been accepted and you wouldn't have the rise of Nazism focus on the racialization of the Jews. That then poses the challenge for today when we hear Jews are white and privileged. The paradigm, the discourse, the lens through which that conversation takes place is one in which a racial lens from an American experience is being imposed upon the conversation between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, I am not saying that there was not discrimination in Israel. I am not saying that there doesn't continue to be issues of discrimination. We know, for example, that when Jews are coming from the Mizrahi world, there is discrimination. During the period of the 1950s, 1960s, it's why the Black Panther movement is formed in the 1970s. We know that depending upon where you came from, the Arab world, from North Africa, from Iran, that ultimately, the languages you knew placed you on a hierarchy in terms of how well or how you didn't succeed in Israel. Aziza Khazoum has written much about this professor at Indiana University who's a sociologist. And yet, that is not the discourse that we hear playing out in the larger world. What we know is, is that the contestation over territory over competing national movements, over the manipulation of religious ideology, and the egos of politicians is very much what the conflict remains about. It is not about race. And what we saw happen in May, which wasn't new at all, but it was amplified tenfold because of social media, and because of the backdrop of what was happening in this country around racial discourse, it was then imposed on the Israeli-Palestinian conversation. And that, of course, leads to the third example of the language of apartheid, a concept that many of us, I think, would argue is historically misunderstood in a larger discourse, let alone when it's applied to the Israel conversation. And when you read things like um, what came from Amnesty International UK, and you don't have to read the 200 and some odd pages, you actually have to read just the first five pages. And what you will find very clearly is that what is being labeled apartheid is not what is happening in the West Bank, but all of Israel proper. That then suggests that something else is at play here. And this is where it's different than B'Tselem, 
As B'Tselem will talk about for sure the challenges that exist within Israel proper, but rarely label those challenges as apartheid. And I don't agree with the label that they use, but they do use it for the purpose of what's happening in the West Bank in particular. But that language, I can tell you, no one in this room, no one that I've ever encountered on a college or high school campus, wants to say, I'm in favor of apartheid. And so when you use that as a label, it then creates a very clear positioning on that spectrum of political identities to suggest who's in and who's out. And most individuals have a very difficult time, rightly so, because this is worthy of serious discussion with people who have good intent to actually listen and engage in a substantial way with the content. And too often, this is just used as a way to hurl a slur in order to immediately create a situation in which it's you beat your wife and I am morally righteous. So this is the conversation around apartheid, and we know for sure that the, what happened in the Durban conference in 2001, where the United States was not participating, and where many of those NGOs raised the flag of apartheid to a high level in order to highlight Israel as the apartheid state, is where the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions gathers much of its energy and momentum. And that then has been part of the historical foundation for not just the BDS movement, but encouraging this understanding of apartheid, which then leads to utilizing Israeli history in order to serve as proof points for how Israel ultimately doesn't have a right to exist. So when you engage with Israeli historiography, you will encounter Individuals like Ilan Pape, who talk about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. You will encounter some of the new historians who talk about certain events in 1948 as serving then as the primary motivation for Israel to remove all of its Arabs. So, for example, the concept of Tochnit Dalid, Plan D. Tochnit Dalid was a very real plan that David Ben Gurion and some of his ministers articulated specifically to deal with the issues of when Jews are in areas with a high concentration of Arabs, do you actually expel them for security purposes and in order to establish a Jewish state? It was not a plan that was meant to be an overarching plan for expulsion. And yet, it was very much on the table for those specific locations. Think about places like Lod, where the airport is located. This idea of Tochnit Dalid is then elevated by some Israeli historians and historiographers for the field in order to suggest ultimately this is what is at the heart of Israel, this desire to remove, to harm, and to get rid of the Arabs who live there. And they become proof points, not only then in the classroom, but are utilized by non-governmental organizations and by actors in order to then articulate a position that is strongly held against Israel. So we see this time and time again, and this is why language matters. And it is very challenging in order to go to this level of detail when you're in the middle of a campus quad, or if you are seeing something, you know, flash across your Instagram or Facebook, or let's be honest, they don't look at Facebook, TikTok and Snapchat, whatever it may be, and actually think about how should I respond to this? Should I respond to this? And do I, as an individual, have the ability, the stamina, the energy to actually want to counter this, knowing that it can lead to social isolation, personal and professional cancellation, and ultimately also an assumption that I'm on the wrong side of history. These are some of the challenges in engaging with this material, and yet 
all the more so why it is necessary for us to be able to disentangle the complexity and be able to navigate those waters of anti-Zionism and where it intersects with anti-Semitism. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments that anyone may have. Yeah, please. Yes, so the question is, I'm repeating for people on live stream. So the question is, why do I include the Haredis, which it's a minority of Haredis who are anti-Zionist? Because there are plenty of Haredis who are anti-Zionist. It's not that small of a number. It still may be a minority, but it's a minority of over a million people. So it matters because these are individuals who live in the state, who benefit from the state, and yet don't want to recognize the state's existence. We also know, yes, it's still small, but it matters. We also know even smaller are the Haredi population who are anti-Zionist living, let's say, in America, who are very much used and manipulated as pawns for anti-Israel bashing. It happens all the time. But why does this matter? It matters because ultimately people say, look, even the Jews don't think this place should exist. And that's why we have to help people understand where the Haredi who hold an anti-Zionist position are coming from and why they are coming from that position. Because like we said yesterday, most people don't even know anything about Jews. So it's quite complicated when then you see identifiably looking Jews standing there chanting globalization of the Antifada. It doesn't make sense. Yes, sir. Yes. Sure. So first of all, I would say you have to start before the 1930s, right? Uh, the question is, when you read history, if you start at 1948, it's a perspective versus if you start in the 1930s. And I would say, absolutely, you have to look much further back, right? And the reason is, is because once again, even if you're looking at what's ha what happened in Europe in the 19th century, it's very hard to understand that if you don't understand why this concept of Zion even matters which is what I said earlier in the talk. If you don't understand why you have right, this yearning for the East, then it doesn't make sense to look even in the 1930s or the 1940s. So you have to look, go way before then. And part of this is then having teachers who understand that. And it's also understanding that this issue of Israel doesn't only begin in 1948, um, and that the Holocaust is not the reason that you have a state of Israel. And I will tell you that too many textbooks, just general studies textbooks that are used by high schools across the country, really do begin with there's a Holocaust and then there's Israel. So if that's all you get in those three pages, and it's literally three pages, then you walk through a very narrow understanding of this place and the history of this place, and you also think of Jews as white because they all look European. Because part of that discussion around what's happening in the Arab world is not included in that. Now, I'm very realistic that I don't expect a general studies public school history teacher to be an expert on all of this, but we know that it intersects with the public school curriculum around US foreign policy, international world history, and current events, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And the majority of history teachers are not nefarious, right? They wanna teach and they want their kids to learn, and yet they themselves are not content experts. 
and they go to specific content uh, programs, like at Georgetown University, Columbia University, where it has the hexure of the university on it, and they are taught how to teach some of this material, and they do not understand the political bent that they are being fed. And that then becomes a serious challenge. The materials, the films that they're encouraged to show their students, they don't understand that actually, if it's advocating BDS, it's probably not appropriate to show it in a high school classroom. But they got it from Georgetown, a center for Christian Muslim understanding that has over $40 million in endowment. So this is a much bigger question then where do we start reading history? It's how, where do we read history? How are we reading history? Where do we start that storyline? And then what actually is being taught to the teachers themselves who ultimately know that they are going to walk into a minefield? And compound this with those who have actually had Holocaust education, either through the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, or from facing history in ourselves, who now feel well-versed to be able to articulate to a student, here's what happened in 1932, here's what happened in Germany in 1942, cannot tell you anything about anti-Semitism. It's a huge issue. And the study of anti-Semitism has not been done in a meaningful and significant way for the average teacher because the focus, if at all, was on Holocaust education. So then they see what's happening today, and they look at what's happening, you know, let's say in New York, in Brooklyn. They look at the discourse that's happening on social media, and all they can think of is, if I engage in this, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. And so they choose to extract, you know, to extract themselves from it. That's a major challenge. Yes. Thank you. I'll tell you a quick story. Rabbi Lerner, what is it? Is it called just biblical criticism, the J-P-L-E-D, right? This is, you know, who wrote the Torah? Who redacted the Torah? Where are their similarities and passages? How do they, right? And then you can date it by certain periods. So I was studying for my master's. This was at the Divinity School. And we had a visiting scholar on Islam, which was incredible, brilliant man. And I wanted to look at, comparatively, points in the Jewish texts in which you have individuals who question and doubt God. We have a lot of them. And I said, can I look at this comparatively with individuals in the Quran who question and doubt God? He said, you may not. This is an academic and a secular institution. And he said, it's actually problematic for Islam meaning it's problematic to put that articulation forward because the premise of Islam is that you submit and you submit to God. And so therefore, we don't have that conversation in the Quran, and you can't compare it. Okay. Right? Like, okay. So we know that there 
are major differences. And in terms of the conversation about Jews in the Muslim and Arab world, the majority of American Jews don't even know this history, let alone the world. Let's be very real. The majority of Jews in America, most of them are very Ashkenazi-focused. And we have, to a detriment, excluded or marginalized or minimized Jews coming from the Muslim and Arab world and all of the traditions associated with it. Because it's not the same. There are different traditions. And that then means we have a responsibility within the internal conversation for Jewish education for creating a more multi-cultural uh, understanding of Jews, because it's not just focused on Jews from Eastern Europe. So we have to do a really, a, a much better job internally, and of course, it's a problem externally. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So, so the question is about the intellectual sort of origins and history of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The BDS movement is a movement that really begins around this period of 2001. It starts from Palestinians, primarily who live in the West Bank. The Palestinians who articulate this position or BDS, do look at the way in which the world engaged in BDS against South Africa. That's a real model. The individuals who are part of this conversation extend from those who are in the West Bank, Palestinians in the West Bank, to some Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel in Israel proper during this period of time. But it's a very elite intellectual circle of Arabs who are Palestinian Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel. The majority of individuals are coming from the West Bank. And they are, they're thinking about using boycotts, sanctions, and divestment for the purpose then of being able to apply pressure to Israel in order to extract itself from the West Bank. It is not focused on Gaza, interestingly, where Israel still had a presence. Remember, Israel has a presence until 2005. There's a variety of reasons, probably. Remember, these two places are not contiguous. They're not as well organized. Hamas already has a foothold. So it is different of what's happening in Gaza compared to what's happening in the West Bank. Durban is a turning point. Because what happens is the BDS movement gets greater international recognition by what takes place at the Durban Conference in 2001. But what happens is that because it becomes extremely political at the Durban Conference around Israel's an apartheid state, and BDS gloms on to that conversation, and uses that conversation to elevate the BDS discussion. And some of the leaders of BDS, they see it as an opening to figure out how they can use this Durban conference to gain a greater foothold within the larger global conversation. Why I say that is because there were some individuals associated with the BDS movement, Palestinians in the West Bank, very few, but some, and also actually East Jerusalem, who were not happy and actually felt quite frustrated that now this was going to be used in a way to promote this conversation around apartheid instead of focusing on the needs of the individuals in the West Bank. Then it gets individuals and figures like Marwan Barghouti and others who have very clear political positions against the existence of the State of Israel, who also become high-profile leaders in the movement. And these individuals, like um, some of those Arabs who are citizens of the State of Israel, 
who are well known in the larger Western world because they are a part of the intellectual elite circles. People like Nadim Ruhana at Tufts University, who then can bring these conversations into a larger American conversation and put forth problematic positions about Israel's right to exist. Because it's no longer just about how do you deal with the pressure of Israel in the West Bank and what it means for Israel to hold power and control in the West Bank. But now it is about, does Israel belong, period, as a part of the national community? And that has been the reigning trope from the BDS movement since the period of about 2002, 2003. There were a group of um, individuals associated with the intellectual elite circles of Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel who wrote the Future Vision document. Documents. The Future Vision documents were a set of documents that were created in opposition to the Israel Democracy Institute's exercise to try to draft a constitution. Under the leadership of Ruth Gavison, who passed away, a uh, law professor, legal jurist, professor of Hebrew University. The IDI said, what would it look like to, for Israel to draft a constitution today? And she brought together, under the IDI's uh, framework, a variety of individuals, including folks from the Haredi community, to try to figure out how do you draft this constitution. She invited Arabs, who are citizens of the state of Israel, and none of them were willing to join. So in opposition, they wrote the future vision documents. If you read the preamble of the future vision documents, it almost reads like the preamble of the BDS documents. Meaning, now it's no longer about what does it look like to have a Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state. It is not about the complexity of creating a democracy when you have these competing narratives. It is now Israel has no right to exist because it was created in sin. That becomes the discourse. And individuals associated with the BDS movement have continued to put forth their position regularly, mostly in larger American platforms and European platforms, but really without much success. There was an interesting piece this week in the Times of Israel. I believe it was written by Chaviv Redigur, who's an analyst and a reporter for them. If you don't know him, you should read his stuff. But Chaviv basically was making the case of why the BDS movement has failed in terms of garnering support amongst the West to put sanctions on Israel because of its control over the West Bank, and how that differs dramatically from the West sanctioning Russia, and why so quickly the West can sanction Russia and use BDS-like tactics with success, and the BDS movement cannot do the same around Israel. So it's a worthwhile piece to look at. I mention all of this because too often, uh, the BDS discussion in the internal Jewish conversation we have seen has been one in which, again, it can be manipulated. If the conversation were truly about how do you engage with the complexity of what it means for Israel to desire to have peace with Palestinians and the pressure of dealing with issues around security, specifically related to the West Bank, it would be a nuanced discussion. But the BDS discussion flattens all of that complexity. And that's been a real challenge for those Jews then who choose to engage with the BDS movement because too often, they're actually being the pawns, the way the ultra-Orthodox are the pawns for the globalization of the Antifada. And a lot of individuals will then say, look, those Jews are in favor of it because they're saying, not in my name do I want Israel to behave this way. And yet, they actually don't understand what is really being sort of done to them and how they are being manipulated by this movement, which ultimately professes to not want the existence of a Jewish state. I'll go behind you and then... <laughs>
supported by the developers for their own commercial reasons. This is really hard if you're just trying to do it for fun. If you're doing it for art, you shouldn't be doing it for fun. Well, if you're so thrilled about it, you shouldn't be doing it for fun. If you're thrilled about getting out of the business, you shouldn't be doing it for fun. Nobody's doing it for that. Or I'm just going to repeat it for the folks on the screen. So the question is focused on um, when the Israeli government encourages policies that actually feed anti-Zionist positions, for those of us who care deeply about Israel and are pro-Zionist, what do we do? Right? Is that, what do we do? I don't have to like a lot of the governmental policies, right? I don't in this country. I don't in that country. And yet, I don't think that that means this place here in America shouldn't exist. I think I work harder. I think I teach my kids to work harder. I think I say here are the aspirations. They're in our founding documents, and here's the reality, and we're falling short. So what do we as individuals need to do in order to try to meet that gap? For me, it's the same for Israel. Period. I think what's hard is that and I know this isn't your question, but I'm going to answer it this way. I don't think the anti-Zionists stop if Israel had better policies. I just don't. It doesn't meet with the worldview and their agenda at the end of the day. I don't imagine that they want to lay down their arms and lie with the you know, lion. I think they actually are very clear what they want. And I'm a big believer if someone shows you who they are, you should believe them, usually the first time. <clears throat> and I think we have to believe them. And this is why I think this is a form of anti-Semitism. Because if it was truly about, you know, finding ways to help Israel live up to its aspirations, then the discourse would be very different. It would be the Mansour Abbas discourse that we're hearing. It would be excited for normalization. The BDS conversation that's happening outside of Israel is more inflammatory than what's happening in much of the Israeli Knesset discussions with the Arabs. Like, that's crazy. At a point in time in which Israel has the Abraham Accords, Morocco, right? Bahrain, UAE. We have more inflammation around hating and vitriol around the existence of the Jewish state from BDSers and anti-Zionists. Like something's not right here. And I'm not at all saying that means you exclude, you don't focus on or engage with the Palestinians. I want to say just one thing. I know we have to go. Khalil Shakaki, incredible sociologist, political scientist. Uh, he has the Palestinian study for research and survey in Ramallah. He used to be also at Brandeis. He did a poll just recently, March 2022. What does the poll show? Hamas will win election in the West Bank should there be elections. It's why Israel has not wanted the PA to have elections. Israel does not want to be sandwiched between Hamas. It means also that the younger you go, the more likely you see yourself attracted to Islamism which is radical Islamism, and it's not because they're more religious. It's because they're calling for the destruction of Israel, and Hamas itself sees itself now as the only entity that has the ability to protect Palestinians in the name of Palestinian nationalism, which is why the whole thing around Sheikh Jarrah, Hamas was involved. The PA was deemed to be the failure. And every time Israel has to engage with Hamas, even if militarily Israel wins, Hamas actually wins. Every single time. So Israel has to make a very hard calculation. I'm not justifying policies. But Israel is not in a place at this point in time in which it's going to engage in active potential partnership with the PA leadership who is not deemed to be legitimate by the Palestinians themselves. This is the challenge. And so I think we have to be extremely realistic, like have a realpolitik approach to understanding what's happening there, while also 
in our own ways, whether it's through philanthropy, whether it's through social justice work, whether it's through the kinds of conversations we have with our children, our grandchildren, our colleagues, those are the ways in which we talk about how that gap between aspiration and reality have to be addressed. But I don't for a second think that if I do that, that anti-Zionists go away who truly are anti-Semites.